British Prime Minister Gordon Brown announced yesterday that an investigation into the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq will take place, but behind closed doors. The British government has announced an inquiry into the Iraq war. Three previous inquiries have already been held into various aspects of the war. None were full public inquiries, and neither is the new inquiry. The inquiry panel is composed of a Baroness and four Knights. They are ITV non-executive director Baroness Usha Prashar, former British ambassador to Moscow Sir Roderick Lyne. Sir Roderick has already given his verdict in an interview in 2006 when he said that even in the mid-1990s there were plenty of reasons to try and take some form of action against Saddam Hussein. Another member of the inquiry is War Studies Professor at King's College London, Sir Lawrence Friedman, a key advisor to Tony Blair, architect of the Blair Doctrine, and the official historian of the Falklands War. He opposed Barack Obama's plan to give a timetable for the withdrawal of United States troops from Iraq as catastrophic. Another member of the inquiry team is historian Sir Martin Gilbert, who has already expressed the view that one day George Bush and Tony Blair will be seen in the same light as Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, the United States and British leaders of World War II. The chair of the inquiry, Sir John Chilcott, has already served on a previous Iraq inquiry, the Butler inquiry, into the intelligence that led to the Iraq war. Many commentators regard the Butler inquiry as a whitewash. The new inquiry will have no power to punish those in whom it finds fault. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were killed in the war. Over 4,000 British and American soldiers lost their lives. The war has cost the United States over $600 billion. On screen throughout this broadcast will be a counter showing the cost of the war to the United States on the day in July 2009 when this programme was made. In Britain, the cost of the Iraq and Afghan wars is £4.5 billion each year. This edition of Timeline asks, what are the questions that should be answered by the Iraq inquiry? The very origin of Iraq as a nation was bound to the decisions of the great powers. Like Palestine, Iraq was a British protectorate carved out of the defeated Ottoman Turkish Empire after the First World War. Unlike Palestine, Iraq had a commodity, oil, that would constantly bring the great powers to its borders. In 1920, Iraq was placed under the British mandate and the following year, 1921, Faisal, the son of the Sheriff of Mecca, was crowned Iraq's first king. Seven years later, in 1928, the discoverer of Iraq's oil wealth and the creator of the Turkish petroleum company, Talust Gulbenkian, created an oil cartel with rights to exploit Arab oil. The cartel eventually came to embrace Anglo-Persian oil the forerunner of British Petroleum, Shell, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Exxon to be, and the corporation later known as Mobile. The British government had taken a major share in Anglo-Persian oil just at the time when Winston Churchill, as First Lord of the Admiralty, had converted British battleships from coal to oil before the First World War. At that time, no one quite knew where the Ottoman lands began and ended, so Gulbankin took a red pencil and drew a line on the map that included Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Syria and much else besides. This was called, unimaginatively, the Red Line Agreement. All this happened before Iraq even became an independent nation in 1932. In 1958, the monarchy was overthrown in a military coup led by Brigadier Karim Qasim and Colonel Abdul Salam Arif. Iraq was declared a republic and Qasim became the Prime Minister. In 1963, Qasim was ousted in another coup 
led by the Ba'ath Party, Arif became president. The operation of Western oil companies were restricted in 1961 and the industry was fully nationalised in 1972. Seven years later, the then Vice President, Saddam Hussein, succeeded to the presidency. Perhaps the first question that the Iraq inquiry should ask is this. Did any British politician or civil servant consider Britain's history in Iraq before taking the decision to go to war in 2003? Saddam Hussein's Iraq, brutal dictatorship that it was, was not always an enemy of the West. The critical turning point came during the long and bloody Iran-Iraq War of 1980 to 1988. The United States and Britain remained in a relative state of detachment for the early period of the war. They were happy to see two regional powers, neither of which they liked very much, damage each other. But as the war went on, the West began to worry about Iranian interference with oil tanker traffic and about what it would mean if the regime born of the Iranian Revolution of 1979 became dominant in the area. These concerns were the origin of the policy tilt in favour of Saddam Hussein. From this moment on, the United States and its allies armed and financed the Saddam Hussein regime. One incident in this war illustrates the West's attitude and it became important later as a key piece of propaganda in mobilising public opinion behind the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The incident is the alleged use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein in Halabja in 1988. It is reported that some 5,000 were killed in this brutal assault. Revenge by Saddam on the Kurds of this area who had favoured the invading Iranian forces. But at the time, the US said virtually nothing about Halabja because Saddam was its ally. In 1988, the year of the Halabja massacre, the LexisNexis news database shows the event was mentioned in 188 news stories in the United States. That's from over 1,400 daily newspapers plus magazines and other publications. The average number of mentions per year in the whole of the 1990s was just 16. But as the invasion took place in 2003, in just two months, February and March, Halabja was mentioned more than 200 times in the US media. Human Rights Watch remarked, By any measure, the American record on Halabja is shameful. The US State Department even instructed its diplomats to say that Iran was partly to blame. The result of this stunning act of sophistry was that the international community failed to muster the will to condemn Iraq. The second question for the Iraq inquiry is this. Will it examine the history of support for the Saddam Hussein regime by the Western powers? Will it examine the suppression of news that might have disrupted this relationship? The transformation from friend to foe of the United States happened very quickly for Saddam Hussein. Given his friendly treatment during the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam could have been forgiven for thinking that the US would turn a blind eye to his 1990 invasion of Kuwait. But it was not to be. The US was fresh from its ideological triumph handed to it by the fall of the Berlin Wall. It relished the prospect of being the only remaining superpower in the world. But it was losing purchase in the vital oil-rich Middle East. Iran had passed out of its sphere of influence with the revolution of 1979, depriving it of an ally only slightly less important than Israel itself. And the world is now called upon uh, to confront another aggressor, another threat uh, made by a person whose values, who has no values when it comes to respecting international law, uh, a man of evil, uh, standing against human life itself. The attack on Iraq was a way of humbling a regional power and gaining new bases in the Arabian Peninsula. 
Globally, it would show friends and enemies alike who was the boss in the new post-Cold War world. The conflict was as short as it was brutal. Again, I said this is the most vicious and cruel attack that I have ever witnessed. And I, can, I only hope that those who are responsible for this can be forgiven by God. Saddam was expelled from Kuwait and his armed forces broken. Still, the US kept Saddam in power by refusing to support revolts in the south of Iraq and by Kurds in the north of Iraq. George Bush Sr. preferred stability under the devil he knew to instability created by forces that he did not control. Iraq was under semi-occupation after the war. No-fly zones covered much of the country. It is establishing a no-fly zone for all Iraqi fixed and rotary wing aircraft. This new prohibition will also go into effect in 24 hours over this same area. Arms inspectors toured Iraq. Sanctions were imposed that cost a million Iraqis their lives. As Colin Powell, Chief of Staff under George Bush Sr., and Secretary of State under George W. Bush said, Iraq was no threat to its neighbors at the end of the 1990s. The third question the Iraq inquiry should ask is this. If Iraq was a broken country as the millennium dawned, why was a second war and an invasion necessary? The truth is that the US elite were moving towards war on Iraq long before the World Trade Center was attacked in 2001. One member of the Iraq inquiry, Sir Roderick Lyne, is uniquely capable of giving evidence on this issue. Indeed, he already has. In an interview in 2006, he recalled his time as a Downing Street advisor in the period 1993 to 1996. He confirms the view that Saddam was contained after the first war with Iraq. Iraq was only a small issue in the period 1993-1996 when I was in number 10, because he'd had the Gulf War. There were continuing skirmishes around Saddam Hussein, but we had the air exclusion zone, and occasionally he tested it out. But there was no really big problem. But Sir Roderick also says that there was pressure from the United States for further action. What I do remember, and that is relevant to subsequent history, is that on one or two occasions in this period, we had quiet approaches from the American government to the effect, what are we going to do about Saddam? The guy's continuing to be a menace, and we need to go back and deal with him. That was happening even in those days. At that stage, I'm talking about, the Americans did not have a totally convincing answer. Our line was, when you have better answers to these questions, come back and talk to us again. In the meantime we can continue a policy of containment, air exclusion zones, and so on. That was essentially what happened. The US elite did go away and come back with stronger demands for action. In 1998, 18 foreign policy experts wrote to the then president, Bill Clinton, encouraging him to attack Iraq and to remove Saddam Hussein. 11 of the authors would soon be members of George W. Bush's first administration. They included Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, John Bolton, and the so-called Prince of Darkness, Richard Pearl. The letter stressed that if Saddam were to be allowed to stay in power, a significant portion of the world's supply of oil will be put at hazard. It went on to encourage a United States unilateral attack on Iraq because we can no longer rely on our partners in the Gulf War coalition. This last point was in part a reference to Saudi Arabia, where US bases had been established before the first war with Iraq, but which were now unwelcome. For the United States elite, losing Iran in 1979 and losing purchase in Saudi Arabia after the first war with Iraq was too dangerous a situation to be allowed to continue. Containing Saddam might have been the best option in 1991, 
but if a stable base for US operations in the Middle East and access to oil were to be secured a decade later, it looked as if war was the only way to get it. What the neoconservatives lacked was twofold. First, they lacked governmental power. This they got when George W. Bush was elected in 2000. Secondly, they lacked an opportunity, and 9-11 gave them that. But to start a unilateral war means that ordinary people have to be convinced that they are threatened in some way. Many millions protested to show that they remained unconvinced, and in opinion polls there was always a majority opposed to war with Iraq. But the government launched a propaganda offensive to try and persuade the majority of its citizens that they were wrong. One central argument of Tony Blair's government was that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction. The so-called dodgy dossier was produced by the government to bolster this claim and Tony Blair even declared that such weapons could be ready for use within 45 minutes. Hans Blix and the United Nations weapons inspectors insisted right up until the last moment that there was no definitive proof that Saddam possessed such weapons. Iraq has on the whole cooperated rather well so far with Anmavik on this, in this field. Consequently, there was no UN resolution authorizing the use of force, as there had been in the first Gulf War. It is this fact which underpins the argument that the Iraq War was illegal. The British Attorney General, Peter Goldsmith, seemed to concur, but late in the day changed his legal advice to support the pro-war position. Elizabeth Wilmhurst, the Deputy Legal Advisor at the Foreign Office, and she had written the original piece of advice insisting that the war was illegal, resigned when her boss reversed her decision days before the war was due to begin. It is about these crucial days before the war that any really effective inquiry will have to ask some of its most searching questions. It must insist on seeing all public and private communications between Tony Blair's government and George Bush's government so that we can really know the reasons why we were taken to war. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. It must demand to see all the preparatory material for the dodgy dossier so that we can see how it was constructed. The inquiry must publicly examine the government's press officers so that we can know how the propaganda campaign was orchestrated. The first advice arguing that the war was illegal must be made public for the first time and Peter, now Baron Goldsmith, must be publicly examined so that we can know why he changed his advice. The UN weapons inspectors must be given a full public hearing so that their insistence that there was no final proof that Saddam possessed weapons of mass destruction can be vindicated. And Tony Blair must appear in public before the inquiry so that we can all know his reasons for ignoring the decisions of the UN weapons inspectors, the majority view of his legal advisers and the repeatedly expressed view of the majority of people of Britain. Strangely, the disaster of the Iraq occupation was all foretold in those first jubilant images of Iraqis pulling down Saddam's statue in Baghdad. That much repeated sequence, transmitted around the globe, contained in essence the whole disaster. At least it did for those with eyes to see. Firstly, that event raised the issue of who was liberating who. The soldier working to fix the chain around the neck of Saddam's statue was Private Ed Chin. He used an American flag to cover the statue's head. A ripple of discontent ran through the watching Iraqis before an Iraqi flag replaced the Stars and Stripes. And who and how many were in the square that day? US tanks and Marines had sealed off the square before admitting any Iraqis. The whole affair had, the Boston Globe reported, a self-conscious and forced quality. Whenever the cameras pulled back, the globe continued, they revealed a relatively small crowd at the statue. Some estimates put the crowd numbers as low as 200, 
Certainly, they were much fewer than the thousands who protested just nine days earlier as US forces entered the city. A Los Angeles Times reporter was a witness to the pulling down of the statue. He records the testimony of an Iraqi who was also in the square. A lot of people are angry at America. Look how many people they killed today. Today I saw some people breaking this monument. But there were people, men and women, who stood there and said in Arabic, screw America, screw Bush. So it's not such a simple situation. Perhaps the final questions for the Iraq inquiry are these. Why did no politician understand what this anonymous Iraqi bystander knew six years ago? Why have so many lives been lost and so much money been wasted before you understood what was so obvious from the very first? This has been Timeline, the Iraq War Inquiry.